Hello, all you hardcore boxing fans out there. How are you doing? It's Big P here, the voice of hardcore boxing. And today I'm joined by Rico from London, my old mucker Rico, who founded Porky's Corner with me. How are you doing, Rico? Yeah, good, mate. Don't have any nightmares. And you forgot to say, you know, you know. <laughs> you, know, you, know. you don't have any nightmares, Rico. We all that lolly you're earning down London. <laughs> How expensive to live in this place. <laughs> 250 quid a month for a tube pass. Jeez. I know. Why is it so dear down there, mate? Because it's the only way how people commute. It's so expensive to park anyway. So you can't go into central London because of congestion charges. So it's the only way how people commute. It's taxis and tubes. And then if you live outside of London or somewhere, if you've got kids, then you drive them around in a car. But that's about it. Jesus. It's work Peacock, Jim, is when the first time I went there, the Martin Bowers' the staff come out and they said, Porky, don't park there. Why? They said, they come round here. I said, there's no traffic warners and there's a right long road upside. He says, no, yeah. no, they come on mopeds. <laughs> I guess you are, because I can't see a traffic warden walking about. I haven't seen any. They come on mopeds, Porky, pull right back here. That's I swear they don't commission these traffic wardens. They just, imagine what a job that is. Every time you give somebody a ticket, you make some money. Do you think so? I think so. I mean, somebody can write in the comments if it's true, but I bet they are on commissions because otherwise I just wouldn't care, would you? I'd just be like, whatever, give a few tickets out and that's it. Oh, interesting. Interesting. It's a very expensive place, though. I mean, I lived down there when I was a teenager and it was two quid on tube back in the day. Yeah. Go. I'd go anywhere. I used to go to Bradley Park. When you were young, it must have been shillings back then. Oh, yeah. No, a, a bit after that, <laughs> two bobs and that. It used to be the purple one. That's the Metropolitan, because obviously I mm. didn't have a park to start with. And uh, Empire Courts, North End Road, Wembley, Harrow. It's no, North End Road, Wembley, not Harrow. H-A-9-O-A-J and Empire Courts. Straight down those steps opposite Wembley Park Tube Station. I used to live in them, them flats there. And I swear to God, it used to be Metropolitan Line to, is it Baker Street? And then one at yellow one or green one. And I used to end up at Hills Court. You know what I mean, don't you? Yeah, the green one. Yeah, yeah. So that District be, Line. Well, I moved to Hills Court. But uh, yeah, and it, and it wasn't as congested as it is now, obviously. It's, uh... Hills Court is nice. That's near where Stamford Bridge is. But it's a nice area. It's very expensive to live in. Yeah, Ogarth Road, Hills Court. That's where I used to live, Hogarth Road, Hills Court. Full of Australians around there, isn't it? I've been told. Well, it, there weren't the pubs around there, do you know what I mean? But uh, and like now I, they all ink happen. Yeah, my auntie used to get uh, my auntie Babs used to get a pass, I think, 40 quid a month. At Tube. She worked in Harrow. First, yeah, time. She worked at a company called First National in Harrow, and that was 40 quid a month. So, so we're going back 30, what we're 33 a year. Look, and you're paying two fifty a month to go on tube. Yeah, seven six. That's it. About two fifty. But but you know what the good thing about working from home is? You save all that money uh, that you spend on tube. No, I'm not using it because I don't go to the office. I don't go to town very often. So you know, you're saving two fifty a month every month. So how do you get your shopping then? You get it delivered. Yeah, now these days, because after, before COVID, I never got it delivered. But then during the heights of the first lockdown, I just started getting food delivered. And then he thought, you know what, all the time he used to spend going to the supermarket, I might as well pay somebody three quid to bring it to my doorstep. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, well you, must be, you must be rolling in it, Rico, then lately. <laughs> well, it's three quid. <laughs> million quid. You're on millions, you, mate. Uh, I wish. I've jotted a few things down. I don't want to give you the same stuff as what I've just done with Terry. Oh, it's here. It's here. Uh, Ray Terry. Terry. Terry, Ray, lad. <laughs> Fitzroy Lodge trainer. Ray, lad. He gives his time up, doesn't he? And doesn't take a penny out of boxing, so we like him, don't we? No, exactly. And he's a straight talker. Can we give him a shout out for Terry's podcast? Yeah. Uh, Beyond Boxing Podcast. Excellent podcast. Beyond boxing, he's got a good episode to come out today, I believe. Mm, he's got, you know what? Terry has such a docile voice; it's nice to listen to. Drift off to got, sleep. I'm not off like that to it. <laughs> exactly. But uh, all right then. 
the big news then, obviously, we'll start off with Kel Brook straight away. Then we'll cover the Matchroom Show, David Allen, Tommy Fury, Callum Smith, uh, Terry Harper, Taylor, Ball, and T- Peter Fury's tweets. So not much, not as much as material as with Terry, but enough to be going on with. Right, Kel Brook. Where's it all gone wrong for Kel Brook? You know what? I was, I was actually looking earlier today. When was Kel Brook's last big win? And that was obviously Sean Porter. And that was 2014. And that was a few months after Carl Froch beat George Groves. Yeah. Since then, he's had both of his eye sockets smashed to pieces. He's gone up to middleweight, been knocked out by Triple G. He's floated around sort of super welterweight limit. And now he's balled himself down to 147. Gone with a new coach into the US to fight against one of the best pound for pound fighters. So he'd be drained at the weight. Um, he's also just out, out skilled then. You know, he was taken out by a heavy jab, wasn't he? Heavy jab. And he kind of felt like he was just completely shot. You know, like when you watch, um, when you watch fighters like Amir Khan fight as heavier weights. They have taken a bit, few too many shots and their body just isn't there. The first meaningful punch landed by Crawford, that just took him out. And that was it. Yeah, it was, wasn't it? It was the first punch. It was a right... It was a... Right jab. Right, a right, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, a straight right, whatever you want to call it. And he, uh, he, he sort of like... He didn't turn away, but... And it, it was like he didn't he didn't want to fight after that one. His ever. legs his legs went. That's the kind of worrying thing where you think that if you're so drained at the weight and in round four your legs are going, and then after that you're just done. And it wasn't like Crawford didn't even go through the gears. I, I felt like Crawford was he probably had a tougher sparring in this camp. Yeah, it's uh, it's quite. It's, it were all it were awful to see, and obviously I don't want to sit here and say I told you all, I told you all, but it wasn't exactly a, a hard one to call. And and the people who've who've spoke out about it, Carl Froch came out and he said, "Well, it's a cash out. It is what it is." And it were, wasn't it? He hung, he hung in there for three rounds, and I want I'm not going to say it's quick because that's harsh. No, I don't. I mean, the ref jumped in and stopped him, but he was gone, wasn't he? I mean, yeah. I think I think if any of the Walter Waite, if the current version of Sean Porter or even guys like Danny Garcia, anybody would have faced him last night, they all would have beaten him. Oh, without a shadow of a doubt, Rico, it wouldn't. I mean, now I've noticed uh, Sky website this morning. Did you see it? Conor Ben is now the leading welterweight in England. Christ. What happened to Josh uh, Kelly? Weren't they pushing him a while ago? I don't know. Josh Kelly against Conor Ben. What's happening with that? I mean, they Adam Booth seems to have gone off at radar with Matt Jum, doesn't he, lately? Yeah, true. True. Go to Adam Booth. He's the best. Now it's <laughs> go to Dave Caldwell. Tony. I got greedy. Tony, no, no. <laughs> Go to Dave Caldwell. He's the best. Well, there's a new there's a new voice in the corner, which is Steffi Bull going, Go on, Terry. Go on, Terry. Go, Go on, Terry. Terry. Well done. Well done. Go on, Terry. Go on, Terry. Do your best. Do your best, Terry. Great, great. I saw, I noticed Steffi were cheering when he, his kid were getting hit. <laughs> I know he was. Let's put Howard Foster on, because Howard Foster's our neighbour around here. <laughs> Most of it, of it fields in Ma. So why, why would you need to do that? Howard Foster's your neighbour. Michael Alexander's your best pal. So why why do you need to uh, be shouting? They, they know they're going to give you an old town, old town decision. Back to back to back to Kel Brook. I I mean yeah, he's we'll come to Steffi in a bit. Steffi yeah, see me. I think his lifestyle out the ring has taken a toll. The weight going up and down in weight, the poor matchmaking. They never really capitalized on after that Porter fight. He should have gone to the US, signed with Al Heyman, and got an American trainer. Because one thing that fight showed, and even Kel mentioned after the uh, fight in his post fight interview, he said about, you know, British trainers or how you train fighters in Britain just isn't anything compared to American fighters. So Kel Brook 
he's a typical example of a British fighter. It's very good at what, I mean, Kel Brook's like exceptional at what he does with that one style. But if his opponent adapts, he can't do anything about it. And him and many other British champions, they all trade on one thing, which is toughness, right? To get to world level as a British fighter, you just have to be tough as nails. And Kel was tough as nails for a long, long time. But the moment the toughness gave out was the moment he was done. Yeah, do you think his style's very similar to Frank Bruno's? Yeah, uh, I, I, th- I mean, yeah, I think his, the punches he throws are, but I think he's, he's quite robotic. a fluid fighter. Robotic. Yeah, he's quite he's quite robotic, but you know what? He's quite good at measuring distance. He's got good timing. Uh, he's accurate as well. I think with Kel Brook, I'm, I'm a massive Kel Brook fan, but I think if he would have went to, put it this way, if Kel Brook would have went to Derek James after the Sean Porter fight and Errol Spence would have went to Dom Ingle or most British trainers or any British trainer more or less, how do you think their careers would have panned out? I think he'd have done better. Yeah. And Errol Spence, would he be as good? Probably not. I don't think British trainers are, you know, I don't think they're used to training fighters that are anything but conventional. So even if somebody's got more to their game, which I'm sure Kelbrook does, and I believe he does, they they can't get his house of them because they train every fighter the same way. There's the slick Ingle style. What was slick about that performance, and what's been slick about any of Kel's performances in the past? He just moves his head. Let me just stop <laughs> you there. Let me just stop you there. The Ingle style. What is the Ingle style? Um, it's the bomber. Nobody Graham. knows. It's the bomber Graham style. Hands down by your side, switches in, and getting on your back foot. That's basically the Ingle style. Kel Brook isn't any of that style, is it? He's no. trained by he was trained by one at Ingalls. Yeah. His style's basically his own style, I think. He's not like a Johnny Nelson, Junior with a Bomber Graham, because they're on there's only really them three that had that style, that Bomber Graham style. They call it the Ingalls style because Brendan trained Bomber, you know, when he when he yeah. came to Nottingham to Sheffield, but he already had that style when he came to Sheffield. You saw the Glyn Rhodes video, didn't you, about it? Yeah. He was one of them who, who took things from Errol because he was Errol's best mate. So the Ingle style, in my opinion, it's a myth that they've created. That's my opinion. But I, I see where you're coming from, but I think we have to call it the Kell Brook style. No offense. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. I mean, he's quite a traditional boxer, isn't he? He's got his hands up, those straight punches. That's a big word. Uh, that's what that's a, a very expansive word for you, Rico. That because that's how you put things traditional. Whereas I just say it's Kel Brook style, isn't it? Chocolate brown is baby, fuck fast, <laughs> timing beats speed. I'm eating steak, I'm eating steak. Greg Marriott's got me eating steak. <laughs> isn't Greg Marriott now the MTK nutritionist? I saw uh. He's now a nutritionist for all the MTK guy. But why did they need? <laughs> but why? But why did they need? Work yesterday, did it? Big nutrition guy. But why did they need a nutritionist when Dom Ingalls releasing cookbooks on how to eat? Dom. Well, we know what Dom likes to eat, don't we? And it's not spinach. <laughs> <laughs> Old Flex Wheeler. The beach is that way. But yeah, just to sum it up, I, I just hope Kel calls your day now. He's made $2 million. Uh, there's no one left for him to fight in that division that he won't get spattered against. And you don't want to see him dragged down to be an opponent for a Conor Ben or... Yeah, you don't want to see that. And actually, he will never work with Matchroom again. So I think he did I think he did the right choice. I think when you look... He's made the money, right? He's made good money. And he's had his big fight. He's tested himself against the best in the division. Um, and you know what? He's made good money from this fight, so there's nothing to gain by fighting anymore. There is a, there is a story during the rounds that Eddie Yearn went quiet on him after when he came back and he had that fight with Fuki when he lost money on the show. Eddie, Eddie apparently spoke to us said, well, I've made money off Kel Brook and I want, I'm just going to keep it that way. I don't think he wanted to get in with Kel putting fights on and losing again. So he kind of like parked him up, but Kel had to think on his feet to get that fight, you know. Yeah, you know I mean? I mean, true. Had 
Terry. They've had to think on their feet. They've got it, and if they've got their piece at pie and they're gone, good luck to them. I'd be gutted if we started seeing people like myself doing videos saying Kelbrook against Connor Ben, you know, uh, two worlds collide and all that rubbish, you know, repeat or revenge, the rematch. And, uh, you know, uh, it'd be like seeing Dave Allen against David Howe trilogy, wouldn't it? I won't, I won't want to see that. And I won't want to see Kel coming back and fighting your Connor Ben's and that. If he wants to be a body for Danny Garcia against Danny Garcia's fighting Errol Spence, loser of yeah. that fight, Kel. I could see Kel trying to get back it mixed that way, but I only see it ending one way. Yeah, and PBC have enough wool to wait in house anyway, so they'd be able to pinch Kel for three hundred thousand. Yeah, but you know what they want to do is that I don't think Kel signed by anybody, so he could go there for free. But I think I just think PBC will probably just want to invest in American fighters that they can build and get these guys over. But actually thinking about. It, Yesterday, Chris Eubank Jr. was on IFL, and yeah, he was, yeah, and you know what, I was thinking about his career. He has went from promoter to promoter, show to show, and now he's up with PBC. He's, he's done, money. yeah. He's, told he's made a lot of money. He told Warren to F off, Earn to F off. They stood the guns, aren't they? It stuck to the guns. Whereas other people... They'd been with Warren first, then gone to Eddie. They got no other game in town. That the, Eddie's the only game in town for a minute once you've left Warren. So they were a bit frightened. You see, when you go from Frank Warren to Eddie Earn or Hennessy to, to, to Eddie Earn, yeah, you can still go to Warren after, but Eddie will tell you horror stories about Warren. He'll say things like, fighters are not getting paid. He'll brainwash them. So they feel that they don't go anywhere else. Look at Dave Allen. He was itching to fight Dubar. And Eddie threw a spanner at works and said, "Hey, they'll pay an extra hundred grand." Frank, you can't play you can't play poker with, with Frank Warren. He's been no. on the he? He knows every move. He invented the move, so he called the bluff and said no. So they they didn't get it the fight the Dubai fight. So Eddie said, "Don't worry, we'll get you something down the line." Since then, he's fought Dorian Darch in a fight that's been investigated. Yeah, I mean, investigation over is Dave getting done. We don't know, but William Hill's been investigating the fight and, and it got stopped. The betting, the suspected betting, we all seen it in Daily Mail, didn't we? William yeah. Hill's been investigating it for a suspicious pattern of betting but on the third round, all at a similar time. Now, whether he gets done for it or not, I hope he done. And I'd like to think he didn't get involved in anything like that, but that's the only fight he's had since the David Price fight 18 months ago. Where is he heading? Dave Allen. But get well, back to Kelbrook before we discuss the White Rhino. What next for Kelbrook? Retirement, hopefully. Retirement. Does he go off the rails? I hope not, but you know what? It's hard to... He's got prior, right? He's got prior, so prior. it's hard to say. Uh, you know what? Uh, hopefully he stays some home boxing, maybe train some kids or something, because I can't see him not going off the rails unless he's doing something with purpose. Well, this is how I look at it, right? I think he'll go off at rails and then he'll have a few, a few go to a few parties, you know, with the ones where you're out of your brains and you're shadow boxing in front of me. I could have been a runner bean and all that. Shoulda, woulda, coulda. <laughs> Makes a comeback and I think just hangs around boxing till he's about 40, punching for pay. I think that's what will happen to me because what else is he going to do? He's not a brain surgeon, is he? No. You can't imagine him in like <clears throat> like a Carl Frotch we a, we a, a study in his house where he deals with all, all his paperwork and all his business stuff once a week and, and keeps on top of things. And I can't imagine Kel doing that sort of thing. He looks like the type of guy that would let somebody else do that for him. Uh, yeah, you know what happens when he lets somebody else do it? The money goes missing. The money goes missing. That's what happens when you're a boxer. And then you come back saying, I could have been a runner bean or a Mr. Bean. Bean! Or a, cre or a creepy bean. Or Rumpelstiltskin. Yeah. Hang on, shall I do it? Bean! Runner bean, could have been, should have been, never been. Baked bean! Creepy bean! Beanie! Rumpelstiltskin. We're on to you. 
That's for you, Steve Welling. Stick that on your uh, asylum. <laughs> Stick that on asylum tonight, Stephen. Andy Patterson and all the rest of the chaps. Rob Kelly, the rest of them. They're all, all right. All good boxing people. But uh, Aussie and them. Right. Uh, so we've closed the Kelbrook one. Right. That chapter's over. Was he managed correctly? Before we finish it, was he managed correctly and advised correctly? Yes or no? Throughout his career, no. Was he treated fairly by Matchroom at the end when they wouldn't give him any sky? Could have had sky last night, couldn't they, in America? Gone from England into America. Yeah, you know what? It's... He did a lot for Matchroom, right? He helped build the whole brand and everything else. So two... Yeah, but 2014, sort of the high of British boxing, you had Frotch against Groves, you had AJ coming through, you had Kelbrook beating Porter in the US, yeah. which is the first time a British fighter beat an American fighter in the US for years and years. Where's the next time. match, though? Well, we'll get to that later, but um, but I think he's done a lot for them, but boxing's always about giving people favours and stuff like that. So I think, I think though, where he was treated wrong was the way how Eddie Hearn went at him, which was just unnecessary. It's just unprofessional from Eddie. I mean, he didn't need to do that. But you know how Eddie is. If he can get clickbait from slagging somebody off that's done good for him, he'll do it. Yeah. I think Eddie's got a Fred West jumper like me. Uh, he probably has a gold chain like you, Porky. <laughs> yeah. I'll have to go take it off him. All right, then. Uh... David Allen, a.k.a. the White Rhino. He's retired age 28. What's happening, Rico? What's happened to him? Fake news. That's what's happened. He's not gonna he's not gonna retire. I mean, come on, what's Dave gonna do? Is he just wanted to beat news again? Does he need his oh, you know, clickbait, right? He retired didn't he retire after the David Price fight? Well, I've just done an interview with Terry now, and I've just said, look, Terry mentioned it. I said, look, Dave Allen retires every morning. When it's time to get up for his for his for his morning run, and he pulls quilt over his head and goes on Twitter or Instagram. <laughs> he tires every day, so I've cut it dead. But people keep texting me and they want to hear my opinion on it and emailing me. So I'm going to give my opinion on it. He's not retiring. It's attention seeking. He needs his media fix, and it can be one of these reasons. But I'll let you elaborate a bit more on it. What reasons do you think it is? You'll give up. Opinion, I'll give I think it might be a negotiation tactic. Yeah. He might try and get a fight he wants or, you know, want to be a free agent or want to do something. Could be trying to get attention, as you mentioned. Yeah. Or it could be a pending investigation, which means that you can come back after the investigation is over. Or... Depending on the outcome of the investigation, because yeah. what, what, William, what, what's the board going to do for somebody that's retired, right? But if they have a, if they come back clean from the William Hill investigation, he has no involvement, or they find that the betting patterns weren't illegal, then he can just continue fighting with nothing hanging over him. Because if there's an investigation ongoing, I'm not sure whether promoters want to touch him. Yeah. Do you feel that uh, somebody, were, if there is an investigation, Eddie would have been tipped off and told him and said, look, we're going to pull you off at a card or something because on the poster you've got everybody with a dance partner and you've got the white rhino versus TBA and you think that might have damaged his ego looking at all these people with and because he was told he was going to be headlining our chief support didn't he and it, it, he's now who sponsors who sponsors Mushroom isn't it William Hill that sponsors some of the stuff I don't know you know I'm not sure it might be I've, I have seen him on some at billboards it could be I don't know in and out don't they but because it could be a bad look. Uh, while they sponsored, did they sponsor him? Why Povetkin? I think they sponsor events, so they do sponsor. Yeah, they do sponsor some matchroom events. So it's a bad look if a matchroom fighter gets caught, or somebody that's recently fought in a matchroom bowl gets caught by their sponsor. It just looks bad on them, right? So they might maybe they said. We can't get a meaningful fight for you or fight that you'll accept and you're not going to get as money as you want. We're just going to clean our hands off this and don't work with Frank Warren. So they might have just cornered him, but or he might have just done it because he thought he's got no other option and he makes good news. 
Yeah, it could be that, or there's a rumour doing the rounds that Jamie Moore drove all the way to London, had a team meeting, and uh, we had and Dave Allen and Dave knocked two fights back, and Jamie Moore were like, oh, I fucking just drove all the way down, and he drove home. Have they had a, had a split there? Because there's rumours doing rounds he weren't dedicated in camp, in Jamie Moore's camp with Nigel Travis and that. We don't know, do we? We're on outside looking in. I don't speak to Dave no more, but it'd be interesting to to see. Is obviously will he be doing a retirement video on IFL and boxing social? Yeah, I, I spoke to um, a trainer recently that split up with a fighter, and they were saying one of the reasons they split up is because they went for camp after camp, as trainers do. Fighter pulls out or is in fit to fight and the fights get pushed back. So that's a lot of time and money for a trainer to be lost. If you're not going to make money, maybe Jamie Moore washed his hands off Dave and Dave said, okay, I need to get a new trainer. I don't have a fight date. I just can't be bothered to do this. That is ninth trainer he's had now then. So is it David or is it the trainers? Well, I would probably say it's David's in that case. It's dedication. It's dedication because trainers aren't going to put time into a guy that's not dedicated or a guy that's not willing to sacrifice. If you want to live in your neck of the woods and want to train as a top boxer, there's only a few gems you can go into and do that. You can go to Glen Rhodes. You can probably go to the Ingle Gem. You can go to a few others. Um, obviously, shout out to Chris Smedley as well. You can obviously go and see Smedley. Uh, uh, has he? I'm not to him for a bit. Yeah, but, you know, he needs to be willing to go wherever the training camps are, whether that's to move out to Manchester and live out there and train from there, move to London to train with Adam Booth, but I don't think Adam Booth wanted any part of Dave Allen. He has, Dave's been to Adam, hasn't he? Had a, he had a, a yeah. And it didn't work out, did it? No, it's not. Adam Booth's no joke in that sense that he's not going to watch somebody you know, taking Instagram photos and not training him harder. Do you think that it all goes back to when Dennis, he turned pro with Dennis and Dennis were paying him a wage every week and said to him, look, your job is to train. You you get out of your house in the morning, you get on that train station, because you know where I used to live, don't you? He's out at the back mm. train station with that. You get on that train into Sheffield, you go to my gym and your job's to train David. You get paid a wage when you fight, you get paid. He didn't sell a ticket as well. He didn't sell an handful of tickets. And Dennis pulled plug when he was 6 you know, and a draw. And I think he left after the draw. He'd have to, probably have to check on box rate. And I think, they, they were, knowing Dennis, there would have been an inquest after that draw. And I think Dennis would have probably said, what's fucking going on here? You're fat as a pig, Michelin man. I don't know, but his job was to train. And he didn't. And Dennis pulled the plug. And if he's at, if he has retired, and we know David, he ain't retired. He's be, he'll be attentional, keeping himself out there. If he has retired, it's a shame. It's he's, he's cheated on his talent because he, he has got some talent. Yeah, he hasn't been brought out in, in the right ways. He has got talent. He's not dedicated, and it's a shame because. I think he does. He used to do hundred and eleven seconds, and it, obviously he's he's a big, powerful six foot three bloke. But if he's gone down that road of being depressed, he'd be sat in out now with twenty lion bars. That's yeah. what he's doing now if he's depressed, and just be flicking through on that all day like that. What can I say here to be in mix? Well, boxing moves on. He'll be seeing people around moving on and thinking, well. I, I could have been fighting the bar. I could have been fighting Amma. Where am I going here? They're offering me Lovejoy, then Mark Bennett, and now I'm on a poster that's TBA, and end, end up big billboard. What's going on here? I can see that. But when I, that I, I can also see that Hearns used him for the views, and him for the. Yeah. All these people, Coogan Cassius, Rob Tebbett, and all these other people that are. I've been interviewing and getting him out there. They all know the game. They don't wait. Yeah. If Dave Allen took time a day if he didn't do views. A boxer who's, who's who's had losses and not got a belt, they won't be interested in him. No, they're, they're interested in him because he does views and he'll come out with quirky comments. But people are already saying, "I've got." I know that's off. See, I know that we're off him. They're already saying 
that his 15 minutes is up. I hope it isn't up because I do want to see him succeed, even though he pissed me off. that He's pissed me off a couple of times, and I'll tell you. And everybody's seen it on my videos. This is a few years ago, this. I had, a, had this Mazda sports car, and I had him in back of it. He just fitted in it. Ingram were in the front filming me, and he turned the camera to, to, to turn it on Dave Allen. And he was diving under foot under my seat in this Mazda I had. And I thought, what's all that about? Because he didn't want to be on the channel, did he? The other time, while we were in a restaurant up Attercliffe, me, Razor, and Dennis, oh, they were having fish and chips. I just had a, a bottle of pop because I can't eat. I couldn't eat stuff at that, that time. I was fat as a pig then, Michelin man. So anyway, <laughs> and Dennis was taking a picture of me and Dave. And I think I've still got this picture to this day. And Dave were eating fish and chips. And he pushed the plate, pushed the plate, because he didn't want it in the photo, and nearly went off at edge at table. And when we got, when we went back to office, I said, what were all that about? <laughs> and, and he says, well, he's a boxer, isn't he? he didn't want you sticking that out, pouring that out. You and Dave Allen ain't chippy, having fish and chips. Well, they were eating fish and chips. So it ended up looking in front of me. So then I've got people saying, oh, I thought you had a gastric band. You, don't, you said you don't eat fish and chips. I didn't. But you can see how his mind's thinking because he's sharp, isn't he? He can act like Daft Dave all day, can't he? But he's a very sharp individual, David. But yeah. I, think, I think he's done his own head in. And Dave, I know you're watching, or one of your gimps will be telling you. I think he's done his own head in, right? And it's a shame. My kid's mum loves him to bits, and my kids. But I think he's done his own head in with this media, this character, Dave. And I think it's become a little bit tired. And when he did the dressing gown thing uh, in the bubble, you know, when they were, they had I fell yeah. out telling that and he's with David Day and he's in a dressing gown. I'm not going to say who, but I had some people who were respected in boxing industry and they said, he's just overkilled it. He just, because he went into Dave mode, didn't he? And yeah. Then, Carrying off like that, and then, well, you're here, you can, you've passed all your COVID tests, we've got your Mark Bennett or Viale, and your trainer's on his way down, I'm thinking, you knock them back, you're not moving forward, are you? Listen, you're not going to get the big slice of cake that weekend, because Hammer's gone, Lovejoy's gone, but you can still have some of the cake, get a win on your belt, and move forward, and prove your ranking and that, and I think when he went, no, knocking fights back, we match them, and yet you do views, I think, well, I know, I think, I know he young himself then. And I think him thinking he was going to be chief support or maybe headline, but I had chief support. And now he's TBA and he's at bottom at poster. You're at bottom at pile, aren't you? Because he's coming off the price loss and the darch farce, isn't he? Yeah. You've got ground to make up. So what do you do when you've got ground to make up? Just fight, Just isn't fight. it? Listen, I know what it's like to come out of prison. You're coming out, you've got a little bit of dough, you haven't got what you've got, and you're thinking, I've got some ground to make up here. You take out to get going again, don't you? You don't just say, now I used to earn, so I used to earn this much before I went to prison. And now, now I used to drive that car, I'm not driving that. You've got to make, you've got to make most out of a bad job, haven't you? And I think, you have, you're carrying on. I call that diva behaviour. Jamie Moore's not earned no, has he? He's gone down no. there, back. You take anything, you get out there, and you improve. He said, he could have had the Yui Fury fight. They were offered the purses, and Peter said, and we'll give him 25000 of Yui's purse as well, on top of his own, because they just wanted to get out, didn't they? Yui, and move forward. Yeah, we'll take Povetkin fight. Yeah, we'll take Pula fight. Yeah, we'll fight Parker. Yui fought Parker for note. You know, he didn't get paid. Yeah. You knew that, didn't you? Now, mm -hmm. moral of the story is... You've not got a belt. You haven't really got that much pull, has he? Yeah, you got a bit of pull on IFL and all that, but that'll soon go to... He, look, it is what it is. We all know what this is, don't we? You can't be acting like a diva, and it's neither the same for a bit. And I've told him on here, you can't, you can't just start acting daft day when you want, when he's a really educated kid. He's a very bright kid, you know, and very, very funny. And he's a nice kid as well. Yeah. I think he's... I think he shot his Senate foot knocking them fights, but Mark Bennett's an eight and one. 
I mean, if you can't blow him away, there's something wrong in it. But he's sparred Mark Bennett, and he? he's sparred Villali. Does he know that, hey, I could get done here? So I, I, I only want to put my Senate mix for Aimer and people like that. And, you know, the, 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 the like, the, the top 15 guys, you know, them sort of guys, top 15, yeah. 12 guys. But really, he's, 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 putting, he's projecting himself into, a, into fights that he shouldn't really be in. Look what happened with David Price fight. But they don't skipping even... levels, skipping levels, isn't it? That's what he's doing, trying to skip levels. And he signed a contract to fight Povetkin, hadn't he? And David Price signed it as well. They both signed. The winner got Povetkin, two hundred grand. David Price got it, didn't he? Two hundred mm-hmm. grand. That's not bad, that is it? No. Nope. Just had the same money for fighting Price and, and, and Alan. So if it had beat David Price and they got that, that's another two hundred in Kitty, isn't it? He even said that on IFL, two hundred grand. There's 200 reasons, 200,000 reasons why I signed it. Yeah, but you've got to beat David Price first. Now, do you want to go down then to fighting for 15 grand against Mark Bennett? You know, yeah, you do. You just take it because you, you, you're trying to, you're a matchroom fighter. Oh, they ain't got a contract. Oh, they ain't got a contract. You're a matchroom fighter. You're there to do a job. They've had you didn't bubble in a hotel all week. Are you just going to say no? Eddie might have smiled and all that. And yeah, we'll get you out on Conor Ben show, but Eddie will punish him for that. And I'm telling you now, I've heard it's an eight rounder he got offered. So that's so well summed up, Ross. That's well summed up. Rounder. Yeah, well, I know he's on it, but if he's been offered an eight rounder and it's true, and he's gone, I was fighting Aimer a few weeks ago, then Lovejoy got messed about with that. Now you're offering me an eight rounder like you did with Mark Bennett, and he's gone now again. You're done. You're done. You're like, I think the best thing you could do, his head's obviously done in. Because when you that, get that close to getting some decent money, you're on good money to fight Hammer. He's Hamer. His head's done in that much that it's become like an afterthought, hasn't he? On bottom at Billboard when really he's headlined before, hasn't he? Well, nobody, the reality with Dave Allen is that, yes, he does views, but in a boxing sense, he's not needed because people don't believe that he'll go past a certain level. It's like David Price at the moment, which is similar to that. We know what David Price's level is. We know what Dave Allen's level is. You can get them on a show to fight against someone and you can try and sell that they've got a good chance to gain the Joshua mix. But the reality is we all know that they're not going to get past a certain level. So they're there as an interesting sideshow, but... Nobody, the fans don't really care about them. There's so many heavyweights at the moment that we only care about the ones that could actually make a dent in the division and make a mark in it. I don't think that uh, he's a retired person. I don't think he will. I think. So. I don't think so either. It might be this weekend. It might have just done his head in, you know, about this eight round. I think that's probably it. He's like, I'm not doing that. I'll retire. He might be trying to force Eddie's hand and Eddie might go, go on then. And if if he's retired, he'll come back in a in a couple of months or so. But his head just might have just he might have just gone. Pfft. Like I that. think I could shake I, him sometimes when I say I could shake fucking life out of you. You're throwing it all away. You can't mess these people about and match them. They don't they don't mess about. I, I've heard I've heard how Eddie speaks to people at after parties. You know we've messed him about. They're, they're mm. serious people. You know it's business in it to them. They're cold as ice. You know. If Eddie can not ring Carl Frotch for six months after he's done Groves, because they want, because they want, want Frotch wanted to know what's happening with Chevez fight. Who the fuck's Dave Allen? If Frotch can deliver what he's delivered, bring pay per view back Wembley and all that, and still not pick his phone up or whatever. If Eddie don't want to phone you, he won't want to phone you. His phone, he's like that all day on his phone. Do you know what I mean? Up and down. He's yeah. He's here all, all day, isn't it? So he won't want any Dave Dave Allen shenanigans. They might all have a bit of a laugh and all that, but it, it, the laugh's on Dave now, isn't it? Yeah, it's Dave, isn't it? He's got a dressing gown on and his and his uh, Bart Simpson slippers. Brilliant. Yeah, we all like that, but don't overdo it. Take your son out of boxing. Come back with a suit on. Go to press conferences with a suit. Get rid of fucking entourage or all fanboys around you. Go to a press conference in a suit and be professional. Get a train around here and start training. Your job's to fucking train, isn't it? Well, it is. That's what they get paid for. I think he'll end up becoming a sparring partner, but like um, Malik Scott, right? The American guy. Yeah. Retired a few years ago. Well, he hasn't officially retired, but he's just their sparring guys. So I think he'll end up going from camp to camp sparring guys 
mimic a British style. He'll make a decent money like that. He can still probably do that. And I think that's what he'll probably end up doing because that keeps him still in the limelight. And it's also a way that he's not going to get embarrassed or hurt. Yeah. All right, then. Well, enough about the adventures of Tintin. <laughs> Because uh, he's done it, he's done it himself, Annie. And Box yeah, forgiven sport. Bentley against Efren. What did you think? I thought Denzel was uh, great in that fight. He clearly adjusted from the first fight. Uh, he took the scent off the ring, and his hard punches when he was a bit more committed, it showed. And in the end, he ended up busting off Bentley's, uh, sorry, Hefron's eye, and then that ended up winning him the fight because Hefron was trying to protect that, and he was hitting him with hurtful shots and. That was only going to end one way after that point. So I thought he fought exceptionally well. And good to see Frank Warren pluck these guys out who aren't Team GB fighters, who are talented fighters in their own right. And Bentley's still young. He's 24, 25. Um, one of Terry's mates as well. So Terry will know a lot about this kid. But I was very impressed. It's good to see a British title win with a stoppage and a comprehensive one. Yeah, do you think that uh, Mark Efron would have done better if he'd have had Michael Jennings longer as his trainer? Because they're saying that they made adjustments from first fight, but he hasn't been with him that long, has he? I don't know. I, I, I kind of felt like the first fight, Bentley was figuring out how he fights in over 12 rounds and figuring out Efron, and he's probably a bit more tentative, but he made such good adjustments, and I don't think Efron could have made any types of adjustments. So Bentley's the more versatile fighter and actually probably hits harder as well. Do you remember when Ronnie Efron turned pro with loads of hype behind him? He was tip yeah. a big thing, wasn't he, Ronnie Efron? You were a big Mark Efron fan back in the day. You oh, you were I a big fan. Dennis to sign him, didn't I? Yeah. I see Fally went, no, no, no. And then he went, he went from 9-0 and oh when he went out at game and then he ended up 20-0, didn't he, or something like that. And and they were all regretting it. But Then he lost to Liam Williams. Yeah, I wanted to see him fight Liam Cameron, but... That's a shame. But yeah, I still am a Mark Efron fan. I think he's a he's a great fighter. He's a massive puncher, but I think he might be fighting it wrong way. Yeah, maybe. Maybe you're right. What did he make of Denzel Bentley? Were you impressed? Good, yeah, we're impressed with him. Yeah, he's a good kid, him, yeah. I'd like to see him fight Liam Williams, but not yet, maybe down the line. Yeah, down the line. He needs a few more years, I think, or a few more good fights, but I think he's just improving and he's going to get stronger and stronger and he's good at that weight as well, so... He's not tight at the weight uh, and he punches hard and that's where you want to see people stopping people at British level. That's always a good sign. Yeah. Uh, all right, then moving on. Uh, Tommy Fury. Uh, fought against yet another guy with no wins on the record. Um, I mean, Tommy Fury is the gimmick that you bring on to get some more views, but I mean, get him against serious opposition and he's going to get wiped out. There's no two ways about it. And the BT commentary, the justification why Tommy Fury is a good fighter is because he's from a quote-unquote fighting family but has no amateur background. So I think Tommy Fury is there to knock out guys that are there to be knocked out. And when they step him up, if they ever step him up, I don't think they will. I think he'll continue fighting at this level and then he'll just retire. Retired 10 and 0 or 12 and 0 or something like that. Yeah. All right, then moving on from uh, Tommy T. Oh, Fury. What do you think about Tommy Fury? I've met Tommy Fury on several occasions. I've known him. I've, sorry, I first met Tommy when he was five years ago. So, how old is he now? Um, what is he? 21? 16 year old. He was stood there in his tracky with his uh, Nike, black Nike Air Max on, same trainers I had on. <laughs> uh, I went through there with Dave Allen, I think. Me and Dave Allen went through there, and Dave changed his mind on way there to spy Yui. But I said, oh, we're halfway there now. We might as well. Peter rung. He says, is he bringing him through? I says, is he now? He says, you're going to spy Yui? He went, uh, oh, no, I don't fancy it today. So we still went through and had a cup of tea and that. But So Tommy were... He would do, he wouldn't wait room doing weights we're into weights, and Tyson come up to me and I says so this is Tommy then he goes yeah he goes I'm a fighting man he says him here he's bodybuilder him he's bodybuilder <laughs> <laughs> and uh, obviously Tommy's got a good physique on him and it and uh, and uh, Tyson with it uh, I mean crack with him saying you can't put muscles on chins and all that but 
yeah, uh, I wish Tommy Fury all the best. I would like to see him step it up, but if he hadn't had much amateur experience, and I think he has, I think he did have a few amateur fights, but not many. Is them four fights that he's had any worse than what any other pro would have? Maybe not, but you also we need to think... Him, can we? No, I don't think we can, but also most pros do that on small hall shows or bottom of the card, so there is more scrutiny warranted if they're going to make a big deal of it on our TVs. And that's not Tommy's fault. That's not Tommy's fault. That's just the way how BT and Warren have wanted to push this guy. If they can get a few quid out of that job, good luck to Tommy. Is Does he win a British title? I don't think so, no. British title might be a big step up. I mean, he'd have to improve a lot from that. Well, I haven't seen him a lot because he's stopped the other guys, but I think British title, if you think about the level of Dan Aziz, Andre Sterling, who fought on the MTK show recently, these are guys that have dedicated their life to boxing for the last how many years? 10 years, 12, 13 years. So for me, the telling thing is this. If you want to become a boxer, you would turn down Love Island, regardless of whatever fame it brings. You're already Tyson Fury's brother, and you just concentrate on the boxing. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Well, we wish you all the best, Tommy, but I don't think you win a British. Uh Eddie Earn, new deal with Sky. Does it happen or is he on his way out? Is he heading for Skid Row? No, I think it might happen now because of the zone, right? The zone crumpling. Yeah, so I think it might happen, but I think it will happen on reduced terms. Less shows for Matchroom, but then Sky will buy more MTK shows. They will end up airing more international content. I think Sky are probably going to. Adam Smith, or Bean as you like to call him, realises that <laughs> he realises that he needs to up the level of the shows and the matchmaking and the only way to do that is by allowing other promoters on the platform and not just exclusively having Matchroom fights. They've, matchroom have too much control over Sky Boxing and that's not a good position for Sky. Alright then. Uh, so but what would you do if you were Beanie? If you were Bean Mason, what would you do if the contract's coming up. What would you demand from Eddie? If I were Adam Smith, and I were, what would I have a demand from Eddie? I'd demand him to come round to my house so I could tie him up and put him in basement. <laughs> <laughs> Bean, we're on to you. And your laptop into it near his police station. <laughs> uh, I don't know, really. Then 20 dates at Sky, right? It's three million quid a year, 20 dates. So you've got 150 a day going in, 150 a date going into pot. Sponsorship money and gate money. If you can, if you can pay your fighters, your security, your venue, and everything out of the sponsorship money and the gate money, that 150 is the promoter's money. That's already in your bank. So you've already been been, been paid. So you're going to try and build the shows out of everything else that's going to come in. That's why he sells the hell out of everything with all the YouTubers. So nobody can fault Eddie Earn's work ethic, and I admire that because the man's a machine. He's relentless. He's a relentless he's man. That way, but it's not a hard job, is it? Talking into a camera all day because he's not done much else. Everything else is done for him. But point, what I would do is I'd give Eddie Earn 10 dates, and I'd let everybody else have another 10. You know, share them out. And not tell them who's going to have them. Let people audition for the day. Say, look, we want to put this show on. We let them all. Don't just give them the fucking date and let them put shit on. Let them put something to you. Can we put? Can we have a date if we put this fight on? Like when me and Dennis went to BBC and we said, look, we want to put this on. What do you think? And they said, oh, well, whatever. We'll, we'll let you know we obviously the, the opening is there for him now, isn't it, with BBC, five years later, but audition for it and, and then say, well, if we do so many numbers, can we have another date? Because when you're on the back foot and you've got no dates, that's what you've got to do. Or you can pay for pay for production and have your own dates on Eurosport, like Dennis, or free sports. But then you've got to pull money in from sponsorship, aren't you? You're going around in circles. If they're going to give you a date, Put something good on so that, so that they give you another date. Let them earn the dates. 
they're going to have to get earned so many because they've got snooker and darts, haven't they? So you yeah. can give him 10 dates, let him mess about with Dazon. We'll let him have 10 dates, clip his wings a little bit and let him go back to the Eddie that we all liked in 2012, 13, 14. You know, I went off him after 2014. Same. Um, you know what? If you think about things like golden contract, I think that's a good concept. You've had some good fights there. Um, there's. It's not about having the big names. I don't want to see Callum Johnson versus number 15 ranked fighter in, what, in whatever governing body. I'm more interested in seeing competitive good fights, and that's the model to do. We'll get on to tomorrow's show, but that's a good example of where Matchroom have failed in an opportunity that should have been there to promote female boxing. Yes, they had females headlining the cards or the card, but again, did we get a good fight night? Probably not. No. Was he entertaining? No. Yeah. Yeah. That show last night was well, probably... Well, look, you know, when I watched that show last night, my phone were red hot. My phone were red hot. Two seconds. Jason, I'm just filming. Let me call you back. Sorry about this. This is twice now, isn't it? Shit, mate. Uh, that show last night, people were ringing and they were saying, basically, that's got to be it now for him with Sky. They can't be getting him. It's got to be game over after that last night. You saw Peter Fury's tweets, didn't you, that he put out? Because I sent you mm-hmm. two emails that have been sent. Take Katie Taylor with him with a punch bag and she couldn't get her out of there, right? She must have hit her with, I don't know, 600 punches at least. Something like that. <laughs> 660 something punches she did to her and she couldn't drop her, right? So she was tough as old boots. It were a racehorse in with a donkey. Terry Harper against that other guy. Terry Harper, if that had gone to points, would she have deserved it if it had carried on like it did? Because she were on the back foot. Now, Ritson was on the front foot. He got the decision. But would that girl fighting Terry Harper, if it had gone to points, got the decision? You see where I'm coming from? Yeah. But we do agree that Ritson, the scoring was diabolical, right? Oh, yeah. But I'm just saying, if you're fighting on the back foot, right, and you win the fight, but you don't get the decision against the matchroom fighter, and then another show, and you're fighting on back foot, and it goes to points. Uh, 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 It's got to be, there's got to be some... Consistency. Consistency, yeah. Yeah. The matchroom uh, fighter goes on back foot. We're all screaming about Vasquez saying he won. But if a matchroom fighter... Let's let's take Terry Harper out of the equation because she knocked her out. But if another matchroom fight, if a matchroom fighter wins a fight on back foot, yeah, do they get the decision? Because yeah, of course they do. Won't it? Won't it? And, and I was watching it, and she was running clock down. It's two minute rounds, and she and she's like staying out of range, keeping it long, not getting involved, coming in, odd punch, and going back out. Yeah, it's all within the rules, but I don't want to see fights like that. I want to see Shannon Courtney, Rachel Ball getting at it. I want to see. Savannah, Katie Taylor getting at it. I don't want to yeah. tell camera. I don't look, want that style. Look, if you if you think about that card, right, and we think about we want to make a card to showcase female boxing. You put on Savannah Marshall against somebody. De- Hannah Ranking. That would have been a good example to have on that card. You have Katie Taylor against Chantel Cameron. You have Rachel Ball against somebody that's competitive. You might have Shannon Courtney against somebody that's competitive as well. So you have four f- competitive female fights, mainly Brett's fight against Brett's, right? That's what you need to have. You can't be dragging these women from other countries that nobody's ever heard of telling us that this is a good fight. Nobody's going to invest in that. It's not something that people are interested in spending their Saturday evening watching unless you, like you and I, are hardcore that likes to watch this stuff. But Generally, it's all about promoting the sports, and that's why UFC has done so well in uh, female mixed martial arts because they put the best against the best. But here, you just you don't get that in female boxing. And Eddie Hearn keeps on banging on about oh how female boxing's great because the best will fight against the best. The purses aren't big, so you might as well just make the best fight against the best because that's the best way to get people involved and interested in that side of the sport. Yeah, I'm just going to read you something out here, Rico. In fact, 
In fact, no, I'm not going to read it out. I'm just going to tell you. Eddie said he's putting 50-50 fights on. You know, every fight, every fight yesterday were one to seven up to one to 100, one eight, you know, on the odds. They were all yeah. shocking odds. But were, were there only one fight where, where, where we let down? Were that where the Doherty fight, was it? Yeah. Yeah. So, but the bookies had, had, had that one, they got that one wrong then. But all of them, if they'd have all gone in Eddie's favour, they would have all been gimmies. Every single fight was a gimme. That's not 50-50 fights, what he said he was going to deliver. He's, his words, not mine, his. We're only going to put 50-50 fight on, 50-50 fights on Cougs. Well, that weren't the case, were it? The serving up shit and the fact that you can get you undisputed women fights. You can have undisputed across the board all in under like 12 fights, can't you? Yeah. That's how Pony is at the moment. It's Pony. Pony. Yeah, it's a limited talent pool and I get that, but they need to make sure that the best fight against the best so people yeah. don't care about the records. I mean, Natasha Jonas against... Yeah, Natasha Jonas, Terry Harper rematch. That could have been done on the card. Yeah. You could have had Shannon Courtney, Rachel Ball rematch. That could have been done on the card. You could have had Savannah Marshall against uh, Hannah Ranking. You could have had Katie Taylor against Chantal Cameron. All of these fights on one card. I'd say that's a very good card. Yeah, I would. All right, then. Uh, moving on. Whoops. Uh, we spoke about that. We spoke about... Tony Bellew, the disappearing man, the man that just won't go away. He's hanging around boxing like a bad smell. Tony I thought Bell he's never been seen since his retirement. He just wanted a quiet life. That's why I thought. Yeah, I mean, he's just done. He's just done two week in bubble. He's done soccer AM. You name it. Family fortunes. Ready, steady, cook. Deal or no deal. Do you know what I mean? He, he's on them all, isn't it? Only thing he's not being in is jungle, isn't it? But he ended up in uh, other one, didn't he? SAS. He's everywhere, isn't he? Tony, the disappearing man, Bellew. I prefer to know. I prefer to call him as Tony, the man that never beat a champion, British, Commonwealth, European, and world. Never took a belt off a champion, and I can rest my head on my pillow at night, and I sleep like a baby knowing that. But do you, Tony? Do you? Because I know you don't. But Tony Bellew has come out and said, "Canelo." Losers against Mundo Smith. What do you think to that? Are we talking about the same guy that should have lost to John Ryder, that struggled against Rebrass and that Dutch kicks, kickboxer in the World Boxing Super Series? All of a sudden, is now some killing machine. And I'm sure Tony's going to tell us that that fight should take place at Anfield when the crowds are back because Canelo would be a huge draw in the UK. Yeah. yeah. Do you remember that one? Yeah, exactly. He's nearly as fun as funny as Tyson Fury taking a million travellers to London and doing a rally. <laughs> That's nearly as good as that. Well, what happened to that? <laughs> I did that. That one died a death, didn't it? Like with seven million to charity. <laughs> All right then. But I mean, look back to this point. I think we're talking about the wider thing about Matchroom and Eddie Hearn trying to push this idea yeah. that suddenly Canelo wants to fight against Billy Joe Saunders and Callum Smith on the zone. After having a court case against the zone and Oscar de la Hoya, which is which they settled, so suddenly they're just going to bring Canelo back onto the platform to fight against less money. I think one of the reasons why Canelo is left left is because the zone, in an article in the Athletic by Mike Coppinger, where they outlined some of the gripes that the zone had, what uh, or Canelo had, what the zone was. The zone didn't see guys like Billy Joe Saunders or Callum Smith as premium fighters. They wanted him to fight against Canelo against, I think it was Oscar De La Hoya, Jorge Mazzevild, uh, Golovkin. So they were pretty strict on who they want Canelo to fight against. And they aren't going to pay, well, number one is he's not going to fight on that platform that he's just had a lawsuit against. Number two is they're not going to pay obscene money uh, DAZN starting to get Canelo back on the books for one fight to splatter one of these British fighters that nobody knows in the US. It's just not going to happen. There's no sense in it happening. And they keep on pushing this idea that I've got a fight for Callum Smith, I've got a fight for Billy Joe Saunders. It's all for Hearn to make, look, to make him look busy 
like he's doing his fight as a good job. Yeah, it's all about Hearn. Yeah, it's all about all roads lead to Hearn, then not it? Don't they? With his book and his comb over. But this is how I look at it, right? He's paying them lip service, which brings me to. He's paying lip service to all them fighters about the zone. But I think he's on outside looking in with the zone at the moment, mate. Mm-hmm. I, think, I think he overpaid everybody and he took his cut. Tommy Coyle got massive money. Tommy Coyle, right? I know people who know Tommy Coyle. He nearly collapsed when he was told what he was getting for that fight in America. He nearly collapsed. He was like, yes, please. Who are Robert Moon? Now... If Eddie Earns overpaying everybody, he's still taking his 20%, isn't he? And it's his own money, isn't it? Yeah. No, Bob, he's just overpaying himself, isn't it? He? he got his hand in the cookie jar, he took what he could, virus come, put him in a tight spot. But the virus has saved him with Sky, hasn't it? Because there's no small hall, is there? Mm-hmm. They share them dates out. They can't now, can they? Because there's no small hall. So he's he's dropped on really. He's been very lucky. But I don't think he's as cush as with the zone as he says he is, mate. I, I, in fact, I know. I called it two years ago. I said, give it two years. It was 25 months exactly, wasn't it, before it imploded. So oh, we're a month out, wasn't it? And everybody went, okay, you're just saying that because you don't like Eddie no more. You used to be a vacuum groupie, okay. Now, bottom line is cash in this business, but... I'd be very, very surprised if Canelo and Callum Smith even fought at all, never mind on Dazone. Yeah. All being talked. I mean, and Callum Smith got a new team around him now. And Cal Yafai. Yeah, yeah, they've Paul Reddy's signed them on an advisory deal or management contract as such. So it's Paul Reddy's signed it. So Paul Reddy was matchmaker, wasn't it? At yeah, matchroom. Eddie's matchmaker. So he's left Eddie, right? And he's set up his own advisory thing, has he? So he's advising Callum Smith and Cal Yafai. Yeah, those are the few that we know of. And then a guy called Delicious Orr, who is a Team GB heavyweight. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. It's a bit of a mess, isn't it? What are they doing with Liam Smith? I like Liam Smith. I think he's a tough kid. I think he's been handled terribly by by Matt And What about... Uh, the Savage, he's left, hasn't he? Sam Eggington. Yeah, he's going to make Hennessy, but he was never a matchroom fighter like most of these guys. I think matchroom washed their hands. It's only Joshua can play stand there, mate. Yeah. Really? Well, Joshua, I think Callum Smith might be in a few others. Um, yeah. But, yeah, so thinking about it this way, Callum Smith fights in a weight division higher where Canelo usually wants to fight. Canelo's gone up the weight, hasn't he? But still, he, he's a middleweight. Nobody knows who Callum Smith is in the US. Canelo, I think there was somebody said one third of Mexican households tune in to watch him fight. What you really want Canelo to fight is against somebody that's known in the US and somebody that's relevant in the US. And Callum Smith is not that. It's not Callum Smith's fault. It's just the reality. And Canelo doesn't want to fight against a guy that's known in Britain that nobody knows in the US because when he's done that fighting against Beefy Smith and R- Rocky Fielding, he's got a lot of stick for that in the US. He wants to fight legacy fights. He doesn't care about belts. Yeah. Yeah, I see what you mean, mate. It's uh, yeah, Callum Smith, it's about cash for him now. He's won a world title. He's, he's got British, Commonwealth, European... And a, and a world, and he's got a ring belt. He, he's ready for what is he, 29 and 0, 30 and 0 or something? He's probably ready now to just get a big, another big payday and get out. Yeah, sadly, there isn't many in that division, so that's the problem. All right, then. Uh, we'll finish off on these last couple here. Uh, we spoke about Peter Fury Streets. Who's the next big pay-per-view star that Eddie's got? And who's the big next pay-per-view star in the country? Is it Daniel Debar? Yard? I, I think it's probably Daniel Debar, but thinking about the pipeline of talent in this country, right? I was looking at this earlier today. Team GB, 2012, produced James DeGale, yeah. Cal Yafai, and Billy Joe Saunders. 2016, Joshua... And 
Who else won a world title? GB from 2016. Oh, you mean who else went to Olympic? Got a medal? Yeah. Well, Coley got a bronze, did he? Did he? Or did he just go Olympic? Yeah, but no medal, but just win a world title. It might be just Joshua from 2016 team. A Coley and Boatsy at stars from the 16 group, aren't they? Yes. Charlie Edwards, were he the 2012 lot? He was. Did he turn pro with Eddie? He did. Well, he won a world title. So that's one world champion Eddie's had from debut, right? I'm not, I'm not even talking about Eddie. I'm just talking in general. Oh, to yeah. start, the, the fighters that are being produced by Team GB, relative to the amount that's been spent in the ERS to produce these elite talents, so the guys that go to the Olympics, there's just not many coming out compared to the US and other countries. The yeah. UK haven't produced in 2016 cohorts I don't think there's one, there's no single world champion. So 2008, that was Billy Joe Saunders, De Gale. Savannah. Savannah, yeah. But I'm talking about male boxing, pay-per-view stars. So 2016 is pretty bare. There's just no another fighter coming true. I can't think of a single one. You might think about Daniel Dubois might be one. He didn't go to the Olympics. But who is there coming true at Matchroom that's going to be the next pay-per-view star? Who are you excited about? Nobody. Yeah. Nobody. I don't see anybody there. Bell, you, the, the, it's recycling. They're recycling stuff like Dylan White and Chisora. Yeah. I'm talking about stuff like that. It's all recycled 30 odd year olds, guys, isn't it? Who've had losses and been knocked out. Yeah, exactly. Luke Campbell, what did they do with him? He's not got a world title. He's 34. And it's, it's the next. He's oh, new. that's it. Best belt he's got is a Commonwealth. Well, so just looking at the men's team, Galal Yafai, Muhammad Ali, the guy that got done for doping, Case Ashfaq, Joe Cordina, uh, Josh Kelly, these are the guys that have turned pro. Anthony Fowler, Buatzi, Lawrence Acoli, and Joe Joyce. So all none of them have got a world title yet. Yeah, none of them are even close to being pay-per-view stars. So it's basically been a failure, the Rio one, hasn't it? He has in terms of pro boxing. So think about the money that the EIS invests compared to a lot of other countries, how much money the UK puts into boxing. Oh, they to an elite. Up there. they're all driving Mercedes cars from Attercliffe, Mercedes dealers. That'd be yeah. Yeah. Petrol yeah, I mean, allowance. They get, they get paid every... When Savannah were there, she was on 500 a week. A Mercedes, they get petrol... They get uh, all the food. They get a, a flat. It's free gratis, isn't it? Yeah, free but something seriously yeah. wrong with UK boxing at the moment in terms of the fighters they're producing. They does, they're they not producing good fighters. Like I just said there, Fraser Clark, he's been there 10 years. Why would you want to get that up to get involved with this load of crap at Pro, pro Game? Yeah. You get free track suits, free trainers. We have it made, Rico. You'll be there. You'll be all right. We had it at top. Yeah, exactly. A blue, white, and red one. It says Team yeah. GB on it. You can get on airplane in your Team GB track suit. So order what you want to eat. Yeah, I mean, if you think, but if you think about the guys the US are producing from the amateur system, um, lots of other countries, even like Puerto Rico, Spain. Sorry, not Spain, Mexico. The UK. Relative to how much money they spend on that amateur program, they're not producing good pro fighters. And, oh, sorry. and that's why there's, there's not many pay-per-view stars coming through unless Frank Warren uncovers the next thing because Eddie Hearn surely doesn't have the contacts or the understanding of boxing to be able to uncover somebody that's not a Team GB fighter. Do you think that Matchroom have basically just raped and pillaged the EIS? Well, that's, that's what they sign. That's their pipeline, isn't it? From, from people that start zero and zero, debuts, the only debutants they sign tend to be from Team GB. The other guys they sign are guys that fight well on their shows, whether that's Lewis Ritten or Rachel Ball, or Frank Warren fighters, guys that Frank Warren spots like Josh Warrington or so forth. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I just think that it's a shame because it all promised so much. They had the little conveyor belt. They had the, all, all the little gimps up there, all, all a bit clicky. But it looks to me like Robert McCracken 
he's took his eye off the ball there because they're more bothered about Joshua. Yeah, well, that's even his other coaches to do with the rest of them. And what are they producing up there? They're all on good money up there, you know, massive money, free grass mm -hmm. all the way, cars, fuel, food, you name it. They're adding, they're having it off, big time. But like, you but is, uh, isn't boxing part of it's about being hungry when you turn pro, to hungry for a better life, fighting your way, you know, out of. Bad situations, fighting on undercards, club shows, all that stuff, only to become, you know, only to achieve something that you never dreamt of achieving. By the time they get to Team GB, they made already, aren't they? They oh, making good enough money. How do you, how do you maintain the hunger to become a championship boxer once you've been paid at age twenty three or twenty four? You've been paid well and you've been looked after. Rico, do you remember Audley Harrison when he got a gold medal in year 2000? He went to every opening of an envelope in London and surrounding areas. He won all TV shows. This is Audley, six foot six, dreads, 30 year old, gold medal Olympian, super heavyweight. We all agree on that, don't we? Mm -hmm. When he turned pro, he turned up for his debut. I think it was your call. My quote, I might be wrong, but. He turned up for his debut in a limousine, mate, in a limousine. Already the hunger's gone. You see where I'm coming from? Mm -hmm. Wrong mentality. The hunger's gone already. That's my opinion, mate, honestly. It's like winning Pop Idol in reverse. You've got Pop Idol, you go on then to make records, don't you? Audley yeah. Pop Idol, didn't he? But he got all the, he got a million quid signing on for you and all that, didn't he? And it, and that's your lot, then. Unger's gone, on it? If you think about guys like Broder that get criticised for once they make it, sort of blowing it all, at least Adrian Broner came from relative obscurity to become a three or four weight world champion, weight, whatever he is. Weight. Yeah. And he made it to that level. But if you would have given that to Broner at an amateur he wouldn't have even made it to the first world championship. He would have blown it or he would have lost his hunger. And that's the problem with Team GB, and that's why this country isn't producing fighters. Yeah. The, the guys that are being produced, the guys like Yard uh, uh, or Dubois is a good example. Dubois is a bit different because he's so big, you know, he's so committed to boxing. But somebody like Yard, no hyperbole around him. He turns pro, fights in small halls, does his own thing. And he sort of makes it to the top or as, as close to the top as he can be, right? He hasn't won a world championship. But that's the thing. These guys are guys that are hungry because they need to make it as a pro to have a better life. The Team GB guys, someone like Nicola Adams is a good example. In what did she really achieve as a pro? Hardly anything, but she's still a star. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're right. Basically, it's looking like Skid Row for uh, McCracken then, basically, for not producing up there, because they're not just going to keep paying him that massive salary, are they? No, and the other thing is, with the Olympics being pushed back by, yeah, all of these fighters that were meant to turn pro this year have now delayed it by another year. Most of them will be turning pro in 2022 or late 2021. So... How old are they going to be? How much wear and tear is their body going to have? How much more fat are they going to be? How much more, you know, content are they going to be with their lives? Yeah. Yeah. Interesting, isn't it? Exciting times ahead, Rico. This is but that's why we love boxing. This is why we love this sport so much, Johnny. What about Bean's new word, isn't it? Rough, tough, froggy, durable, all action, compelling. Sparkling! Did you hear him last night? Sparkling! <laughs> then he was talking about that show. Do you know what, right? Let me, let's finish on this. The rimming last night about Katie Taylor from Macklin, right, and Bean was, it was biblical, wasn't it? That rimming, there's no, I've never heard rimming like it in my life. They were like, they were reading off a script. It was, only thing that they didn't say was, we're just so happy to be in the same arena where we can inhale the same breath as Katie Taylor. It when they, when Matt, 
when Matthew Macklin said that there's no other athlete in the world that is as universally liked as Katie Taylor, I know he spat my drink up because I was just like, most people do not know who Katie Taylor is outside the UK. You're telling me there's no other athlete in the world that's as liked as Katie Taylor. I put nothing against Katie Taylor. You know, she's, she's a good uh, boxer. But don't tell me that she's pound for pound the greatest female fighter ever. And don't tell me that she's the most universally liked athlete. We know who pound for pound is Ann Wolf. If Ann Wolf knocks on your door, go and watch Ann Wolf YouTube, all you hardcore. If Ann Wolf knocks on my door and says, Porky, you've sold the car three years ago to my mate. We're not happy with it. You've dodged us for three years. Money back, or you're getting a good idea. I will give her the money. And Wolf, and Wolf used to t- uh, train James Kirkland. Yes, she did, yeah. And he was frightened to death of her. <laughs> yeah. I don't think he ever lost it ring with her, did he? No, he lost to others. Yeah, he, he kept leaving her because she kept flogging him to death, didn't she? <laughs> Probably. Anne Wolf is the scariest woman I've ever not met, and I don't ever want to meet her. She scares me. I have nightmares about Anne. <laughs> have you ever seen some of her interviews? She's a scary woman, eh? She's, yeah, and that Lucia Reich is another good female fighter. She fought Jane Couch. Yeah, she did. Jane, you know what? Jane's tough. But, you know, one thing about last night, it's nice to see Jane on telly. It was nice to see her um, when they were showing... They were showing Jane Couch at home on the Sky oh, Show. Yeah, she did a spot. Yeah, so it's good that they're actually recognising her finally. Maybe they've tried to shift the narrative a bit, but for a long time, Sky were not giving Jane Couch any credit, but it's good to see... Jane, at least on the telly, and hopefully they get her commentating. Hopefully yeah. they give her a gig. We want to see Jane Couch, more of Jane Couch on Sky, Ed Robinson. If you don't, you'll have a big problem with me. Come see me, Ed. The oh. other person I thought that was quite good on the commentary was uh, Natasha Jonas. Yeah, I thought she was brilliant. You know, as like yeah. an anchor. Yeah, I, th- I mean, you know what? Get rid of Anna Woolhouse, bring her oh, in. She's, she's got a go her. She's got a go her. She's a fan girl. She's no good. She's no good, mate. Useless. She don't know nothing about boxing. Get rid of her. Company. She's a company man, isn't she? Like Johnny. Yeah. Johnny can stay because I'd have nothing to talk about if we didn't uh, have Johnny. Johnny, come see me. But uh, the other one, Natasha Jonas, she spoke brilliantly. She's also a knockout, isn't she, as well? She is. She is. I mean, who would you take her out? Who would you take out for a drink? Katie Taylor or Natasha Jonas? <laughs> you wouldn't take Katie Taylor out, would you? Because she'd drink water with goldfish in it. Tasha I mean, the thing, the, thing about, the thing about Katie Taylor is that they are pushing this narrative that she's the greatest ever female fighter. She's a credit to everything. You know what? She's an exceptional female fighter. She's an exceptional boxer. She's got fast hands. But let's not forget that she lost to Delphine Pursuit in New York. Yeah, we, we all know that, don't we? It's a bit like the narrative that David A keeps pushing about, which is all right, stronger, faster, quicker than a speeding bullet. Yeah, yeah, but he's eating kangaroo meat, mate, so... Where do I have my mouth, mate? He's 36, <laughs> going on 26. I mean, I, I mean, I've got it mastered now, haven't I? And he's even eating kangaroo meat. Well, if you, if you lived here, he'd be eating dog meat, mate. It's like <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, my dog won't eat dog, uh, dog meat now. He only eats uh, food I have. So I, I, that's another thing. I need to do a tough love on Rocky, don't I? <laughs> but uh, starving for a few days, he'll soon eat his pedigree chum. But no, uh, the Katie Taylor situation, mate, it's just beyond control now, isn't it? It's out of control, isn't it? Well, we all know the fight we want to see Chantel Cameron against Katie Taylor. Get it done. I want to see Chantel Cameron and Katie Taylor, Natasha Jonas against Terry Harper, repeat or revenge. And I want to see Clarissa Shields against Savannah for middleweight yeah. title. I've got to see them fights. Eddie's got to make them. We can't keep getting these school dinner ladies and putting them in with, with people and they're getting flogged. I don't want to see that or getting some bird who works in a bar and putting some gloves on her. No. Put the proper fights on and we'll take it serious because these two-minute rounds where they're going up back foot and running clock down for one minute, 45 seconds, that's not good for boxing. It ain't, no. and I be, well, I know reaction work with emails again. It's not good people are handing the Sky subscriptions in and Sky are offering them mega deals. 
If you cancel now, they're offering mega deals, mate. Mega deals. Free movies, free cartoons, free dog bounty hunter. Do you know all stuff like that? You know yeah. Remember that, dog the bouncy hunter? Yeah, I th- I'm sure you watch it with the kids. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right then, Rico. Well, listen, it's now Sunday. Quarter past three, so we've had a good old chat, haven't we? As always. I hope you're well. You have a All good what's left of it, and I will speak to you tomorrow. Don't have any nightmares. Sticking my lines, you're getting like that young Leon. <laughs> shout out to shout out to young Leon. Young Leon, and what do you think to young Leon? He said that Charlie Duffield loses against Tommy Fury. <laughs> I've got my- uh, you know what? You know what? Shout out to Leon because, as you said at the end of the video, not many people want to come on the channel because some of the abuse people get. Uh, you know, you've got guys in the comments like somebody said, "Put you on my neck." Whoever he's speaking to, uh, so you've got you've got some strange people following this channel. But you know what? Leon comes on here, gives you the questions, uh, wants gives his opinion. Uh, so that's all encouraged. He's got more balls than Porky's missing teeth. <laughs> I've got Mark Tibbs on channel Tuesday night, I think, or Tuesday at some stage. You know what? Tell Mark to put the lights on in the room. It's a bit, it was a bit well, dark last time. I'll tell him. But I spoke to him before. I had a chat to him before, and he, he looked all right with a tan and that. And then when he got on there, it was really dark. And I see you looking well, Mark, but I was trolling. I was meaning to put your light on. But I'll, uh, I'm going to ask We're going to go balls deep with Mark again. Balls That's what he said last time. Yeah. I'm going to ask him uh, if he thinks Tommy Fury beats his fight at Charlie Dar- Duffield. I don't, if they fought now, I think Tommy loses because obviously Charlie Duffield's a good fighter, isn't he? But young Leon, yeah, he go way off there, won't he? <laughs> but he's <laughs> had the balls to come on here and there's a lot of people who say they're going to come on here. Then they say, well, I'm shy and this and that and blah, blah, blah. blah. I ain't got time for you. Everybody has a lot to say for themselves. On the comments section, I ain't got a problem with that, Rico. But why can't they come on here and say something? Hey, why not? Because are they not who they, yeah. they are, or are they people that we know and they're just trying to take this? Yeah, but you know what? We encourage the comments, though. It's always good to see comments on videos. But we encourage it. But like I said, some of them they're a little bit close at knuckle, and then obviously they them at office block them. If they get because they don't want me to see stuff like that, but I always have a peep if I'm bored at night, and uh, then they start with emails, and I don't know how to block them on them, but they'll they'll play block them, don't they? But I just think that people should come on here. You don't have to be hardcore, you can be a casual, you can still come on, let's hear your voice. That's what it's about coming in and talking boxing. Yeah, we do want you to be hardcore like us and live and breathe it 20 hours a day or 18 hours a day, like me. But come on, don't be shy. That includes you, uh, you up north, the, the ex-Navy lady. You're welcome on here. You keep stalling me. <laughs> lady Marsh, Lady Marsh in the comments section. She's supposed to be coming on, but I think she's got a squeaky bum. <laughs> a bit like We'll Paul, find out. <laughs> a bit like Paul Cross, his bum starts to squeak when I ask him to come on. But he's all right, really. But, all right then, Rico. Well, listen, you take care. Give Jess my best. See you, mate. Take care. See you later. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Well, that was uh, Rico from London, born in Finland. Nice guy, Rico. Found a porkies corner with me. I hope all the boxing asylum gimps on the live chat are watching now because I might be coming on there later, because I will be watching. I might come on and just uh, show it, show me face, or leave a comment, keep all you uh, hardcores happy, because I know you love me, really. Right, that's it. It's dinner time now for Big P, 20 past three. Right, I don't know if we're going to get these out today. I don't know. I don't know if I can be bothered. I'm knackered. All right, so peace out. Keep on trucking. Keep sporting boxing. Big shout out to Innovation Alloys and SYPS UK Limited. Ta-ta.